Hello, hello everybody and um, you know, welcome to another episode of the um, Greatness Engineering Hour show. Uh, I'm here today with three fantastic ladies. So for our audience in the US where uh, Regina and Renee are you know, from, uh, good morning and good afternoon to the audience in South Africa and good evening to my people here in Perth. So, like I said, I, I have some extraordinary lady today. They're gonna have the chance, you know, to uh, talk about what they do, and uh, it's. I think it's gonna be very inspiring. So, I'm Mireille Tulekima. I'm the host of the show. Uh, I am the founder of the Mireille Tulekima Global Leadership Organization, which is an organization which empowers individual and organization and make sure that they take control of their own you know success their own result and become the best that they can be so we we guide them um, so that they can actually engineer greatness uh, in their life in, and and really realize that they are limitless and that's in this you know uh, spirit that i started the greatness engineering show where I invite uh, people to talk about their story, mostly story of triumph, and story that can inspire the audience to, uh, to actually take action and to, to realize that they can do it as well. So Regina, Renee, and Ailey, welcome. And uh, thank you. <laughs> so thank Regina you so much. Is the CEO and founder of transform your performance. Um, she's also a multicultural transform uh, transformational leadership coach and consultant on, you know, she's, she's focusing on diversity and, uh, and inclusion, but she's also, uh, you know, a very, very, very uh, good champion of women. So she spent a lot of time on um, empowering women. She speaks and she also knows her. So she'll get the opportunity to talk about her, her in, de in detail uh, later on. I have also Renee. Renee is based in, in New York as well, like, like Regina. Uh, she's a criminologist. So we'll learn a lot about it today because I don't think we, we, we had the opportunity to, you know, to meet a criminologist in, in, our, in our life, actually. And, uh, and the, the most, you know, um, the most impressive thing is that she uses artificial intelligence um, together with uh, a criminology uh, background to, uh, to actually, I mean, um, for diversity and helping the criminal justice as well department. Uh, in, in the US. And I have Ailey. Ailey is in South Africa, in Johannesburg. I met Ailey a few years ago. We were in the same uh, woman group, the Willy group. Ailey is a fashion designer and she specializes in uh, regular old and plus size clothing. So she's also going to get the opportunity to talk about herself later on. It's going to be very inspiring. So I just want to start, you know, by, you know, asking uh, to our free guest to talk a little bit more about themselves, who they are, what they are doing, and um, specifically, you know, uh, guide us through um whatever led them to where they are today uh, so i'm going to start with you regina um tell us more about you yes good morning good afternoon to everybody i'm delighted to be here today with you all and uh i'm regina hugh i'm the founder and ceo of transform your performance with the same website transformyourperformance.com as you said i'm a multicultural transformational leadership coach also a consultant for inclusive diversity and i have a huge passion for diverse leadership for female advancement for co-creation also between women and another passion which is dance which i discovered a little later in life than most people do because there was no such thing where i grew up so i'm uh, also a, an inspirational speaker and author of the book speak up stand out and shine which is on amazon and uh, and a dni white paper that i published last year for which i used seven not seven eleven <laughs> eleven mm -hmm. 
in leader, uh, diversity and inclusion leaders in, in finance and in, and in law. And it's uh, free for download on my website. So what I do is I help organizations leverage their diverse talents by humanizing the workplace, as I call it. And that is done through inclusive leadership workshops and coaching. And I've also created a signature process, the Powerful Leadership Transformation, or PLT. And with that, I help my private coaching clients accelerate their success. Mm -hmm. And uh, also few workshops around it and have created a PLT certification program. I've already um, certified four people, uh, three on the African continent and three in the U.S. Now, you wanted to also, wanted us to hear a little bit about our stories, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. I just wanted okay. to know how you came to do what you do and to be where you are because it's i mean i know that you're from germany and then you live in new york so just want to understand a little bit of your background and what led you to what you do right now yeah so my background is quite eclectic it's it's not the typical you know i have to go from this to there to there it's it's quite eclectic it includes a lot of different things i grew up on a small farm in a, in a tiny village and I think what, what really pushed me out into the world was my adventurous spirit and, and my curiosity. And, uh, and when people ask me, you know, why do we do what you do? I sometimes don't know where to start because I think every single thing that we did before, every single phase in our lives is, uh, usually builds up to what we do now. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a preparation for our next chapter. So my current chapter is coaching and consulting and uh, and uh, this but this curiosity also uh, had me move a lot and so I've lived on four continents, worked on five continents so far and counting, right? Mm -hmm. so I have a mix of corporate and entrepreneurial background and I've owned business in Argentina and Brazil and now in New York and that has taught me a lot. And sometimes even more than I really wanted to know, <laughs> because mm -hmm. I also have to deal with corruption and with mm -hmm. lessons, let's say. But as with many people, some of the most painful lessons have really been my greatest teachers, mm -hmm. including a fraudulent business partner in Brazil. And that particular experience really cost me my previous business and a bunch of money. And, and at the time, it even also cost me my self-confidence and my mm -hmm. self But it's also taught me the most important lesson. It's probably why I do what I do now. And uh, it taught me to take full responsibility of my life. Mm -hmm. At the time, I had two I could stay in victim mode, which is highly disempowering, as we all know. Or I could move out of victim mode and into a self-empowering mindset, mm -hmm. which I decided studied holistic healing. So I was familiar with, you know, subconscious programming, energy, and all these different elements that make who we are, and that really helped me as well through those tools and techniques. And and I decided to to start over again and move mm -hmm. again, this time to New York City from Brazil, and to build a brand new network and, and business in New York. And that's also why I decided later to, to, to write that book because I did some tools that helped me during that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which we're going to we, confidence you did that. Which we're going to talk a little bit more about later mm -hmm. on. But I really like, you know, the story and the international aspect and the fact that, you know, you realize around the journey that at the end of the day, you are the one in control, whatever happened to you. And we, we're going to come back to, to that later. Just want to give the chance to Renee to also introduce herself and tell us exactly what she's doing and how she came to do whatever she's doing right now. Thank you so much. And it's certainly an honor and a pleasure and a privilege to be with you. Um, of course, I'm a criminologist and a criminal psychologist, mm -hmm. and I also specialize in criminal profiling. I didn't begin there. I began as a journalist. And then I went through many careers in media and public relations and public affairs. And after that, I started to study psychology 
and I specialized in uh, psychotherapy and rehabilitation. And I started to work with uh, incarcerated population uh, mm -hmm. here in New York City, many of them returning citizens, focusing on concepts like therapeutic jurisprudence and looking at issues such as reentry and resocialization and reintegration. Mm -hmm. And while I was doing that and working in the uh, criminal justice system, particularly the Manhattan courts with diversion programs for individuals who were uh, uh, facing uh, addiction and also facing jail time, I realized that many of my clients had a criminal record. And that is what uh, made me embrace criminology. And while I was studying uh, criminology, uh, specializing in uh, delinquency as well as deviance, I decided to... Uh, look a little deeper and at that time uh everything was about 9 11 and uh and, and terrorism and mm -hmm. i decided that i would um focus on that and then i i also uh, got a master's certification in uh, terrorism studies and to that add some forensic psychology and some neuropsychology and criminal profiling and uh, that is how my entire career came together within the criminal justice system and while as a criminologist which is you know the focus is on lawmaking law breaking mm -hmm. and law enforcing i specialize in homicide crime scene investigation uh, of course i also look at violence and i've worked across uh, the world uh, speaking and helping uh, governments uh, reduce uh, violence and reduce homicide and particularly looking at gun and gang uh, violence mm -hmm. here in the united states and while doing that uh, one of my colleagues had uh, told me about a particular case in a courtroom uh, in which she was working. And we realized that the criminal justice system had now started to outsource decision-making to algorithms. And algorithms are, are the essential ingredient in artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And we started to realize that many of the decisions, because the data that was being used was dirty, and meaning dirty, it had uh, many of the old historic biases in it, uh, mm -hmm. given the history of racism and uh, in the United States, that many of the decisions being based on this data were really not accurate. And what we mm -hmm. saw were black and brown people being incarcerated again in a rate that was disproportionate to uh, white Hindu, uh, people. So again, it piqued my interest. And as I started to engage more with artificial intelligence and tech, I realized that diversity, equity, and inclusion were critical issues. And not only uh, ensuring that women and, and individuals of color and persons with disability uh, were involved in the process, but also looking at diverse intelligences and ensuring that artificial intelligence is an interdisciplinary uh, process because mm -hmm. we know the promise is extraordinary, but there are also many perils that we are seeing if individuals are not engaged in this process, if it's not democratized, mm -hmm. if it's not used to empower, because what we're seeing in the early stages are, are many of the loopholes and the risks that are creating some of disadvantages. And I think I've always been a champion for people, uh, given my history from journalism, right into psychotherapy, uh, working in the court system, working in the prison system, working with incarcerated individuals, working with victims. I also specialize in victimology. And I think it all just came together for me. So uh, right now, I'm really enjoying this space. I'm now starting to make um, some waves in it. And mm -hmm. the response has been extraordinary. And I just want to ensure that we democratize the process and we make it available for all. But I'm also very very diverse. I have a background in fashion, so I'm very wow. uh, excited to hear. Yes, I worked for a decade at the uh, Fashion Institute of Technology here okay. in New York. Uh, I also have a, a background in uh, designing evening gowns, which is something that I've done over mm -hmm. the years. So I think I, I keep that uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, spirit in the things that I do. So again, it's a pleasure and I look forward uh, to this conversation. Wow, look at all of this. I mean, women, we are so multi, multi, you know, multitask and we fit yes, everywhere. I'm just so impressed and uh, it's just so fascinating to be able to, um, you know, mix the technology and also the human, you know, the human it is. aspect of it and try to blend it to uh to to actually you know come up with solution that can actually help you know? and to change lives that's and the change main life thing. as well and improve and, lives yeah mm -hmm. and diversity and inclusiveness is actually one of the key you know uh, um problem right now and we will come back you know on on that i just want to um 
uh, make sure that Ali also, you know, can introduce herself and certainly, you know, uh, have a, you know, a word on how she managed to make a difference as well, and you know, um, and and you know, create some greatness around her, you know, environment uh, in Johannesburg through her fashion uh, as well. So, Ali, tell us a little bit more about you. Hey, Morel, good to see you. Lovely to see you after so long. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. And hello to the other two ladies. It's hello. Such a good to be here. It really is. Thank you. Yeah, um, my story is I left school skinny, and within a year and a half after leaving school, not having mom's home cooked food and living away from home and adjusting, I picked up a fortune of weight. And back then, there really wasn't anything for plus size, in inverted commas. It's, I like to actually refer to it as size inclusive, but for want of a better word and for hashtagging and searching and Google and all those things, um, yeah, plus size is the word. And I just realized that there just really was nothing for a young 20-year-old girl to be buying if she wasn't a regular size. <laughs> and I had fallen in love with fashion very early on in my life. My mom was a great seamstress. My grand was a phenomenal seamstress. And I went to design college after school. And in my second year, I suddenly had one of those aha moments that I really needed to start making clothing that would make a difference. Mm -hmm. At the time, I never really thought about the making a difference point. I just needed to make clothes that would fit me so that mm -hmm. I could actually have a life out of staying at home behind the closed door. I got into it. I was a very different kind of fashion designer. I draw with my eye. So pattern making was a hell of a challenge for me because that little 0.5 millimeters and 0.1 millimeter was just, I think I had ADD. It was just never diagnosed. So I just used to draw straight onto a piece of brown paper. And what I started doing was I started measuring myself and then taking those measurements and translating them onto paper. And I'd be out, you know, I'd be at a club, I'd be at a restaurant, I'd be at a dinner party, and I'd have all these women come up to me and say, excuse me, please, can you tell me where you bought your clothes? And the more it happened, the more I realized there really was something in it. Fast forward 25 years, I'd run my own business. I did wardrobe planning. I used to make full wardrobes for people. And at the age of 40, I gave up smoking and I had a complete and utter breakdown. My body just literally shut down from the shock of giving up smoking. And I couldn't get out of bed. For three months, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't function. I couldn't think. And in all of that, I realized that what had happened was I'd actually thrown my crutch away when I gave up smoking. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I needed to go in and I needed to actually look at what had provoked this complete breakdown. And as I slowly started to work on myself um, in a very holistic way, and I started reading things, and one of the things that I read was a book called The Secret. And I had this thing that I would always take a book that was, refer was referred to me and I would just open the book on a page. And whatever page I opened it on, that was the page that I would read because I believed that that was where the real message was coming from. And I opened the secret and the page I opened it on was the law of attraction. Mm -hmm. And I never ever read any further. I just got it. I got that exactly what I was putting out was exactly what I was getting back. So what was I going to put out? And I had the moment where I just decided that I needed to take this talent that I had to make clothing for women who weren't regular, well, who weren't thin, let's put it that way, who were mm -hmm. like a regular size or an odd size or a plus size. And I needed to actually go and share it and do something. So I took the plunge and I opened a retail store. I'd never done retail, um, but I just knew that I needed to actually go and create a space that was safe for women of all shapes and sizes to come to you. And it has been the most phenomenal 15 year journey. I, I don't just make clothes. I make a difference way <laughs> before I, I make clothes because my whole thing was to create a space where every woman could walk in the door 
And she wouldn't be told, oh, if you're a small, you shop in that corner. And if you're a plus size, you shop at the back of the store and there's a rail and there's five things on that rail. And if they fit you, great. And if they don't, mm-hmm. I created a space where from a small to a 7XL, all shop on the same rails. And that was very important for me. You know, that, they, that, that a woman could walk in and would feel honored and would actually have choice. Choice was the huge thing for me. Mm-hmm. I just wanted them to have choice. And it's just been an incredible journey. And, you know, I still struggle with my weight. I still have issues with it. I'm up and down like a yo-yo. But I've made peace with that too. And I've accepted that, you know, I'm able to relate to my clients. And I'm able to have way deeper conversations with them than just about buying clothing. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it's a, it's a topic that really does need to be spoken about a lot more but then again it's a topic that nobody wants to speak about so i have my issues around it you know the media are not keen to talk to me they're not keen to feature a designer that is supposedly aiding Mm -hmm. being fat you know they don't and i get that i do understand Mm -hmm. that you know from a media perspective they would get the backlash so I just go about my way. I have a phenomenal group of women that I go out to every week. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we just make clothes that fit. And while we make a living, we make a difference. And that for me is, it's been the greatest reward of everything. It's, it's just amazing because, I mean, um, especially when you, you, you talk about fashion and physical thing, you know, we have to understand that it comes down first from what we have inside and people not, you know, wanting to talk about it. It's actually not a good thing. And I, and I really appreciate people like you opening this door and creating those, you know, this safe environment for a woman to actually start to open up and be really happy with who they, what they are and what they, you know, what they wear. So it's, it's, it's tremendous. And, uh, and, and it's actually very strange that the media doesn't want to talk about it because most women are actually not thin, you know, in, in a lot of countries. So we need to cater for, you know, the population that actually in, in, this, in this basket, you know. So that's, that's good. So next time, I mean, as I see that you all, you know, have, you know, different, uh, you, you've tried different things. I mean, you had different chapters in, in your life. But as, you know, as an entrepreneur or uh, as, you know, a woman taking risk in whatever you're doing, what are the toughest, you know, um, moments that you had in your life? And how did you come out from, from it? I mean, what tool did you use? What resources? And, uh, you know, how, what was the rhetoric, you know, that you were uh, telling yourself? Uh, Regina, if you can start on this one. Yeah, so as I mentioned, yeah, I was um, going through a very painful experience in Brazil with my business there. I had had a very successful business before in Argentina, but I just wanted to move into something new, so I decided to go to Brazil. Um, and uh, I had been building this business for about two years. It was a brick and mortar business. It's also really, you know, uh, intense in bureaucracy to build a business in Brazil and all of that. So, so it was a painful experience. But then I did notice that the person who caused this, you know, was really a teacher in that situation. And today I'm, I've learned to be grateful for the experience because it has taught me so many, many important lessons. And then I came here and what am I going to do next? And how am I going to use all this experience, all this expertise, everything that I did before? Uh, how can I use this in a new project? And that's how Transform Your, your Performance came about. And uh, I, I also did this powerful leadership transformation process where I think we have a lot of background noise right now. Can, can you hear that? Or is it only me? I, it's fine. I'm no, just saying. It's it, okay. I think it's not on my end. Okay. Okay. So, um, so I was. Uh, 
you know, thinking how I can pull it all together into this uh, also process, powerful leadership transformation, where I focus on distinctive uniqueness, which is also, uh, which then ties back into diversity and uh, on a self-empowering mindset and on a body and energy conscious presence, which then all together lead to more effective action and more success. So, you know, I've started thinking more about um, really deep things like, what is our distinctive uniqueness really? What makes us unique? And what is authenticity? What does that even mean? We talk so much about authenticity, but it's actually our authentic It's not just about being ourselves. Because, mm -hmm. because yes, it's parts in us that are self-limiting. And you know, it's, 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 so I think showing up authentically is also about becoming aware of this self alienation that we all experience as human beings, mm -hmm. those big aspects of our programming that we uh, acquire over, over a lot of time. And uh, we acquire that as we all know through our culture, our upbringing, all the external factors, but also even already in our genes, which is a lot, what a lot of people do not know. So I think we have to really go back and see, okay, what is that authentic essence that you mm -hmm. are? Why are we even here? And that's what really brings us to our purpose in this life. And then, of course, you know, I had to upgrade myself to a self-empowering mindset at, at that moment, because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to build something completely new mm -hmm. <laughs> without self time. Uh, so I had to trick myself into, um, into confidence a little bit. And these tools are uh, techniques to mentally, physically, and energetically prepare for challenging situations, such as speaking or, you know, meetings, whatever is challenging for everybody. It's not always it's for everybody, right? And also, you know, uh, we don't really talk about energy enough. I've mm -hmm. learned a lot about how energy works, both through dance and through holistic healing that I studied. So when we talk about even a self-empowering mindset, not all of it is mental yeah. because we can think positively all day long. We can work really hard and we can make ourselves do things and take action, but it can still not be successful. And that's because we don't embody that self-empowering piece. Um, we, don't, we don't really live on a visceral level. We don't understand that visceral level so it's really mm -hmm. a daily exercise that's not just mental but also energetic and that's i think where you know our body and our energy come into play and that's why I also included the, the body conscious presence mm -hmm. element in my work really body and energy conscious presence and you know when you go into corporate and you talk about energy first people think of People still think nowadays that it's a bit it's a challenge, isn't it? People with you know the spiritual yeah. side and energy, it's sometimes very challenging to explain to people. So yeah. yeah. But if you give them concrete examples, it's actually really easy. They get mm -hmm. you know, especially the women who need it the most, I think, because it can really upgrade their business power and presence. Um that they, they really get it when you give them concrete examples mm -hmm. and exercises. You know, science has also now caught up. We now know that everything we are is energy mm -hmm. and uh, it's not a cool idea. So why don't we put more attention to energy, right? So that is also a big part of my work. and It makes a huge difference uh, mm -hmm. for, for the women when they exercises and when they really become aware of their inner power it's about connecting with that inner power that we all have and mm -hmm. that is really unlimited uh, and uh, you know I always like to say when you're not connected to your inner power it's like you're turning on a tv set without plugging in the power cord power mm -hmm. energy cannot flow. so we really have to plug in this inner power cord before we even go out into the world before we go out to speak mm -hmm. and, and, and make so because I, we were, you know, we, we missed you in Johannesburg, Mireille, but we were in Johannesburg together with Renee at the conference for Female Wave of Change. And a lot of women came afterwards to me and said, hey, you know, there's something about your energy mm -hmm. uh, when you're on stage. And, you know, without having to be perfect as a speaker, we can increase that 
and, and I don't mean fixed by energy here, I just mean that inner energy, yes, mm -hmm. which is different to the other concept. So that's, I mean, these are very important elements of my work. And then of course, the diversity aspect, so the distinctive uniqueness. I believe that when we are fully aware of this authentic brilliance that we all have, this genius that's inside of us, and you, and you call it that greatness, right? I mean, right mm -hmm. yeah. When, we, when we're fully aware of that, then we don't have a need to feel threatened by other people's greatness. So mm -hmm. we, we, no longer, we no longer have that need to compete and we can find exactly. that, save that precious energy that goes into competing and use it for something else and use it to co-create instead and come together. And that idea also really um, brought about the collaboration and the co-creation that I'm doing with Renee uh, nowadays in the in the arena of AI and diverse leadership because they the two things have to come together and so we bring you know our unique experience background to the table and then we co-create something bigger together and that's how it ideally you know is supposed to work so i mean a, a lot of good a good element here the, the first thing is you know when you, you are on the low you know you, you really challenge the you know trying to re-energize yourself and expand yourself by learning new things and trying new things you know that's uh, that's number one that i understood from from you second thing is to 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 really understand that we have multi-dimensional uh, I mean, uh, beings. So there's the spiritual, but there's also the, um, the physical, so all the energy, and we need to connect all of this to really explore fully our, you know, our, our greatness, like I, I call it. So that's good. And the other yeah. thing is that we, we can connect with other individuals to actually create something bigger. Wow, I like yes. it. I really like yeah. it. It's, uh, it's really yes. um, We all talk about mindset all the time, and it mm -hmm. is about my a lot about our subconscious, actually, much more so mm -hmm. than about just because we are so hypnotized all our mm -hmm. lives through all of those influences and, and what we call programming or, or conditioning. But it's, 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 all, it's not only about that because we, it's all connected. All the elements that you just mentioned, Mira, mm -hmm. they're all connected. Exactly. Um, Mm -hmm. so being, right? Thank you. Yes, Renee, tell us, tell us some exciting things. Uh, I'm, I'm really getting to enjoy it. Sure, I think uh, for me, I've been blessed, I would say, with empathy. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I've used uh, throughout my life. I think I had uh, some of my greatest success stories working with juveniles, juveniles mm -hmm. who were incarcerated or juveniles who were uh, substance abusers. And uh, I think I've been able as a psychologist and as a criminologist to really tap into empathy because every life has a great story. Mm -hmm. Every life has extraordinary potential. And sometimes it just takes one individual to tell you that you're okay to change the trajectory of your mm -hmm. life. And when, we, you work with, when you work with young people who have been the victims of extreme violence, when you work with long, young people who have been the victims of a criminal justice system that may not always be embracing to diversity and equity and inclusion in the criminal justice uh, process, when you work with individuals who are victims of domestic violence and interpersonal violence. So I think I've spent so many years working with individuals who've been exposed to extreme violence. Some of them are newborns and some of them elderly. And I think throughout that process, I've been able to use therapeutic jurisprudence use the law to help people heal, uh, use myself and my own experiences to help people heal. And I think that's, that's very powerful. The ability to know that you have transformed a life, that you have given someone a second chance, that you've empowered someone with the life skills that they need, the protective factors and the support and the confidence for them to go out there and feel that some part of this world is okay for them to exist. And I think many times we don't understand that. And I think for me, working in the criminal justice system, working with lives that people have given up on, 
working with people who have been marginalized and sidelined, you really realize how much we take for granted and how much we go about our own lives, not often paying attention to the other things that are happening to people. So I think for me, uh, I've seen great successes. I think in my own life, I've been told no a lot of times. I remember when I was 21, I became the first female sportscaster uh, on television in the Caribbean. And at that time, women weren't doing sport. Women weren't on television speaking about sport. So I think I've done so many firsts in my life that I understand, you know, when people say no to you, they're just giving you another way to do it. They're just saying to you, it's not no. They're just saying, try something else. Try somewhere else. Try another entry point. So I think for me, it has always been also that ability to know that you can have multi-potential. So sometimes people say to me, you're a journalist, you're a communication specialist, you're a media specialist, you're a criminologist, you're a criminal psychologist, now you're into tech and you're an AI, you have a background in neuropsychology and forensics, but it all comes together and it all makes us the individuals who we are. And then you, they say you have a love for fashion, but it keeps me busy, I tell them, so I'm really never bored. But I think as individuals, as people, we've got to learn to love people again. And I think that's what I do. I love people and I truly care about people. And I think this is what gives me my greatest power to continue moving forward because I always believe a mentoring relationship is reciprocal. I have learned so much from the people I've worked with. I've worked, learned so much from young people who were incarcerated, from women who are incarcerated, from men who are incarcerated. I've learned about love. I've learned about connectedness. I've learned about the meaning of family. I've learned about the importance and the power of relationships. I know about the importance of a hug, someone to say good morning and, and hello, and, and someone to make you feel loved. And it really comes down to no matter what we are doing and to no matter how successful we are, who are we as individuals? Who are we as people? Because when it's all over, you are only going to be remembered by how someone made you feel. Yeah. And my greatest mentor yeah. in the world, Dr. Maya Angelou, the deceased, and I had the opportunity to spend uh, some time with her and of course to interview her and to write about her. And she was an extraordinary friend in my life. And I think her, uh, the first time I met her, you know, she said, she looked at me and she said, uh, you know, you walk with sunshine. And that's what I try to bring into people's lives, just a little bit of sunshine. Wow, I don't know what to say after that. It's just so inspiring. And you know, and you know what I understand is that, you know, you, you talked about empathy. We we tend to, you know, judge people. We see a situation, exactly. we see somebody, and yet being we, we, we are judging, we don't even know the, the background, the story. Exactly. And people like you are very important because we make mistakes and people that you work with. Who are incarcerated made mistakes. Mistakes. You know, it, it brought But it doesn't define your entire yeah, life. It doesn't who you are. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It doesn't define them. So there's always, you know, an opportunity for them to to learn. To and make change, a change. To make a change in their life. And it's it's very important to, you know, to pass this message. It's a, you can't condemn people because they And we've got to be more supportive as a society. Exactly. We've got, we say we want change. Mm -hmm. We want people to change. But mm -hmm. how supportive are we? And mm -hmm. that's where I come from, providing that support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's good that to bring those stories as well because then people understand, you know, what's happening, what's going on, and how we can actually help because some of us we don't know how to help we see a situation exactly. we have been conditioned and we just you know behave in a certain way and we don't realize that it's wrong so it's also good to bring that and to have specialists mm -hmm. like you to talk about it and to guide us and it's it's uh, it's really a wonderful thanks uh, it thanks is for thanks sure for um highly um, we want to hear your inspiration as well. I, I know you have a lot to say. <laughs> um, I think for me, first and foremost, Morel, is about that thing of taking the plunge. 
So when I went out and opened the retail store, knowing nothing about retail, it wasn't about opening the store. It was about believing in why I wanted to open the store. So there was a very, very clear idea of what I wanted to do. I wasn't going to listen to how everybody else was doing it. I didn't do research on how plus size stores were laid out. I, I based it on if I was a client of Haley Joy's, what would I enjoy? How would I enjoy shopping at Haley Joy? And I literally, that was my blueprint. I created big change rooms. I chose my store outside where there was wheelchair parking outside and there was no step up into my store. Because for me, it was that thing of, and it's actually so much of what Renee was saying as well. It's about making people feel special. And if you're in a wheelchair and if you're overweight and if you're depressed and if you're struggling with divorce, it doesn't define who you are forever. She's a hundred percent right. But if there's somewhere, a, a space, a person who actually goes out of their way, I cannot tell you 15 years later, every new client that comes through the door of Haley Joy comments on the change rooms. And those change rooms were, were really thought out very carefully. And it's that thing, if a client in a wheelchair needs to go into a change room with a carer, they can both fit into the change room and get changed and be able to move around in the change room. Those are huge things that, you know, when you're, when you're working out dollars and cents, you're like, oh, space, space, space. We need another rail. So somebody else would have chosen to have another rail rather than have two big change rooms. So that for me was really important, was about honoring myself and going for it. Because it was scary. I didn't know much, but I went for it. And I'm very glad I went for it, mm -hmm. number one. And the other thing that I wanted to say also that was very defining for me was when I had my moment of realizing that what I was doing by doing everything myself was not beneficial to my business. Mm -hmm. So I guess I have to admit that I am a control freak and I went <laughs> through a long period where nobody could ever do it as good as me. So I just had to do everything myself. And I think part of the burnout at 40 was also that I was working 18 hours a day, seven days wow. a week, could, could never go on holiday, could never go, take up a dinner invitation because I was always cutting and I was always doing and I was always sewing. And I crossed paths with a woman indirectly. Um, and then we made contact again and I actually offered her a job. And at the time my hubby was like, because he's in the business with me, he was like, we can't afford her. And I was like, you know what? We can afford her. I'm going to halve my salary. I'm going to just learn to live differently, but we're going to employ her because she is going to change everything about the way we run our business and it was life-changing for me i have a production facility where we make all our own um connections mm -hmm. and i was running all of that and i was trying to be in the store and i was trying to be the face of Haley joy and so i think for me what i've learned one of the biggest lessons i've learned is you have to choose your tribe carefully mm -hmm. but you also have to come to terms with if you're a control freak Somewhere in it, you have to find a way to hand over. And it was life-changing for me. I work with an amazing production manager. She is the light of my life. She's very strict. So she's very one-dimensional. It's, mm -hmm. it's systems and, you know, this is the way it should be. And I'm the typical fashion designer. I can have 500 mm -hmm. ideas in two minutes. And she keeps, she reins me in. She's, um, she's just so good for me. Mm -hmm. and it's been so enlightening to sit back and go, sure, I handed it over and it didn't all fall apart. <laughs> you feel good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's a great feeling. It really is a great feeling. Yeah. And then also for me, another thing that I did, which um, is something that I do want to share quickly with you, is realizing dreams. And you know, in all of this, we always have a choice. We have the choice to go, oh, no, I can't do it because it's too expensive and it's never going to work and I don't know enough and blah, blah, blah. And then there's the other <laughs> side that says, just go for it. Mm -hmm. Like I had a dream to design my own fabric 
literally for 30 years. And I'd dabbled in it. I went overseas. I worked in Hong Kong. I worked in China. But the problem there was that you needed to order a minimum of 1,500 meters mm -hmm. per color per print. And you know the size in Johannesburg. I mean, yeah. well, who was I going to sell 1,500 meters of the same print to? Mm -hmm. Anyway, to cut a long story short, because that's a story for another time, I um, subscribed to an iPhone photography course. And within a month, I realized, whoo, I can make prints out of my photos on all these amazing apps that are available. We live in the smartest world, Morel. You know. I mean, this I is know, yeah. amazing times. We do. And mm -hmm. I literally grabbed an opportunity. I had never even looked at Photoshop. I knew nothing about Photoshop. I'd just been told that there's a beast and don't go anywhere near mm -hmm. it because, oh, you need years and years and years. And my hubby came home one day and he said, oh, he said he's a gym with um, a young guy who's a graphic designer. I said, invite him to dinner. You have to invite him to dinner. I need to pick his brain. Anyway, he came around and I said to him, Craig, this is what I want to do. I can see it in my head. I'm not very techni technologically adept. Yeah. I'm actually quite challenged. But if you can help me, um, 10 easy steps in Photoshop. I'm going to go and buy a printer and I'm going to start printing my own fabric. And he gave me 10 steps. I spent three days going one to 10, one to 10, one to 10. Mm -hmm. And I mastered it. I know nothing else about Photoshop, but I've got 10 steps in Photoshop to make a fabric print. And I now print 80%, design and print 80% of the prints for Haley Joy. And that was realizing a huge dream and taking a huge plunge. It was not a cheap machine that I bought. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I approached the accountant and I told her what I was going to do, she's been my accountant for 30 years. And she looked at me and she said, is this one of those fashion designer moments? And I'm like, yeah. And she it said, is. it's a very expensive machine. You can't lose interest. And I said, I promise you, I promise you, this is a dream that I really need to realize. And I did it. And we're four years in to designing our own prints for plus size fashion, because there's mm -hmm. a different print for different body shapes. And it is something that I am unbelievably grateful I did because I have such joy from it. It brings me huge joy. And it's yes. something that I really put out there. Live your dream, realize your dream. Don't hold yourself back because you're the person who holds yourself back. You can use the excuse that it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. and don't go for it because it is the most rewarding feeling when you actually realize a dream that you've dreamt for 25, 30 years. Wow, that's, uh, that's powerful. And, you know, and I like the fact that you said, you know, when you start, it's really actually about something bigger. It's not about you. So you have to have this dream going on and then, you know, and compare here, it's difficult to, you know, to start over, to, to, to go out of your comfort zone, you not knowing anything about re re retail and, and really trying to learn in the process. So it, it, it's really important to fight those fears and, and go for it. And, you know, you, and then you realize later on that it's not just about going for it and not having the, the passion. You know, you can't do it on your own. You have to mix with other people, connect with other people, with different genius to actually make it happen. And then it becomes something bigger, like what, you know, Regina was saying and then Renee as well. So it's never, you know, it starts with connecting yourself and then connecting with over and then you create a fantastic, a fantastic uh, World. So I, I think something goes oh, sorry, but I, one yeah. other thing that I do actually want, want to say as well mm -hmm. is that for you know I, I had a production facility um, it was me and a seamstress and then mm -hmm. when I grew bigger and I employed a production manager we grew the factory and we have 20 machines and we have seamstresses mm -hmm. for me what has been a really beautiful journey as well is it's been training a woman I mean, my, my lady who finishes in the factory, she does all the finishing. Mm -hmm. She was a sales lady in a retail store. And she came to work for me, for me, and I saw her staring at the machines one day, and I said to her, would you like to learn to sew? And she said, oh, I'd love to learn to sew. I said, I have 10 minutes. If you can learn something in 10 minutes, I'll give you a chance. 
and she's been with me for eight years and she is phenomenal and she mm-hmm. has never sewn anything. And I think that that's, you know, building, employing genius, but mm-hmm. I think also building up your team from within. That's been hugely rewarding for me as well to see how they've grown and how brilliant they are at what they do. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's that's good. So always take the opportunity to help you know people around you, and you know and mentor or coach them so that they can grow and you know and expand as human being, like you said. So great, you know, great uh, inspiration today. Unfortunately, we're getting close to the end. I don't want it to end. But what I want to ask you is, you know. Um, what are your expectations for the future? I mean, you've obviously all accomplished so many things and you keep going and you have so much energy. So what, what is the legacy that you want to leave? Uh, do you have any idea about, about it? Um, I'll start with Renee. Renee, tell me. I think for me uh, now, particularly as we're existing in uh, this digital world and of course AI, and listening to Haley's story, uh, her 3D printer brought her lots of uh, joy. And mm-hmm. while you know we say that AI, it, it really provides all this promise, it's for people to be a part of that digital dream. Mm-hmm. And I really wanna see that. What I'm seeing is with this uh, artificial intelligence, the digital divide is getting wider and wider. And it's one of the reasons I decided I wanted to do something that really could build awareness and that could educate and that could empower. So right now, I'm involved in a project at Columbia University. I'm mm-hmm. a, a scholar with the Columbia uh, University Community Scholars Program. And I'm really honored that the university is supporting this program and I have the ability to use uh, their resources, academic and uh, uh, personal individuals in there to mentor me. And right now I'm started the research for a book and a documentary that's really going to uh, hopefully uh, leave some impact as well as they're supporting me with some projects in uh, New York City, in uh, communities of color, where I can go into those communities and really start to educate individuals Mm -hmm. because much is gonna change when it comes to employment, when it comes in the ways in which this world is going to interact with the ways we're going to interact with machines. And not everyone is prepared, you know. People keep talking about AI, thinking that uh, they're gonna see some extraordinary machine that's gonna come out of somewhere some you know gigantic Very robot is gonna come, you know. <laughs> but un, not realizing that it's happening every minute every mm-hmm. second right around us so certain things like data privacy algorithmic authenticity these things are very very real mm-hmm. and i think as a society we've not embraced that yet so that's definitely something that i want to do as we move with artificial intelligence and just in general i think i, I just love people Mm-hmm. I love people. I love people's stories. I think it is my love for the human story that made me uh, move into journalism at the age of 18. And mm-hmm. it really changed my life forever. I think we are the authors, uh, the architects of our own scripts. Uh, we have an ability to erase, to edit, to delete, to change, to write new chapters, to get rid of chapters. Uh, to hide chapters if we don't want those chapters exposed. But I think I also believe in us having voice. And I I support anything that gives individuals the voice to share their stories, uh, the voice to ask a question, the voice to remain curious. These are the things that I love. And for people to know that knowledge is something to be shared. We are living in in the greatest time of knowledge production. Mm -hmm. And I want everyone to believe that there's something about you something about your own life that is knowledgeable that can change a life. You don't have to be a great success story. You don't have to be a celebrity. You don't have to be a world leader to change someone's life. And I think we've also forgotten the importance of what it means to be a neighbor. There's someone next to you, Mm -hmm. you know? Now in in the world of social media, we have all these virtual neighbors and friends. I mean, look how we all connected, look what we're doing today. And I really want us, you know, I keep saying that we are moving so heavy into algorithms and AI. I don't want us to reach a place as a society where an algorithm has to reteach us how to be human again. Never lose our humanness, Mm -hmm. never lose empathy, never lose that ability to understand, you know, what's going on in someone's life and never lose an opportunity to say that I am here and I can help you. 
And that's, Ooh, that's what keeps that's, me moving. That's, that's definitely a big one, a big legacy that uh, Renee is talking about. I mean, we have, you know, like she was saying, we have the ability, we, have, we are limitless, we have the ability to change anybody's life. And we, we have to do it. We have to do it for humanity. We have to connect with people, understand, you know, uh, where they come from, understand how we can help them and, uh, and, and really be there. And even if, like you said, even if we are in the fourth, you know, industrial uh, revolution where it's about technology, we should actually use technology to bring more humanity so thank you so and much. use it to create a better world you know use it to use the imagination mm -hmm. to create more extraordinary things that bring us together as people as humanity fantastic regina what legacy do you want to leave it's a big well, one uh, yeah i know it's a big one and i think it's just to answer it shortly it's twofold so first of all uh about the individual i really want to see more people and specifically also women depend less on college degrees and their analytical thinking and what other people tell them they should be doing and really look at the wealth of brilliance and genius that they have inside of themselves and, and that's about purpose and that's about living a fulfilled life and not just listening so much about what other people think they should be doing and you need this degree now and this other degree then and you know it's not really what gives you a fulfilled life necessarily because yes knowledge is important but it's only potential power it's really about how we use our knowledge and how and it's about our intuition and about our heart power as well at the same time about that inner power and and the power of our soul i call it sometimes so that's not meant in a religious sense more in a spiritual sense but really is it that we talked about authentic essence earlier and that has to do with our purpose right the difference we want to make in the world the impact we want to make but also the growth we want to experience for ourselves the evolution as that human um, idea. and then um, you know because i i believe that we are educated out of our out of our intuition and we really need to bring that back and, and really learn how to connect with our hearts again and then the second uh, part of it is really to humanize the workplace this is why i chose this title and in the diversity and inclusion field to go away from looking at individuals as representative groups as boxes where you put people into in those categorizations and really look at the individual and how the diverse they are as individuals not as a group uh, because i think that you know we, we have all these affinity groups and they they have been useful to give a voice to people as individuals but it's also really important to look at how are they implemented are they really still um uh, serving our purpose of creating more inclusion or are they maybe sometimes even counterproductive because we create more siloing so it depends on how they're implemented and and i think that's something that i also want to inspire to really not get stuck with our best practices so far but really look at next practices now i think we time is ripe to look at, at the next phase in in that sense i think we are we are, we are behind uh, so that's something that i would like to inspire i can't do it alone so i've created a, a dni round table here in new york but you know it, it's, a, it's a slow process to put this into people's heads but i'm, I'm still not gonna stop talking about it <laughs> yeah i mean it's, it shouldn't stop you it, it might take a lot of time but uh, you know even if it's baby step you have to keep going because that's that's really important and that's really what's what's going to make a difference um, so we lost highly. Uh, it's it's such a, sh a shame. We we are getting to the end of the show, and uh, I just want to ask you. I mean, if this is for the audience where they can actually you know connect with you. They want to continue the discussion separately um, in the future, and uh, also know if you have any event or any you know um, anything that you you want any message that you want to to pass on to them um sorry on linkedin yeah. on twitter 
on uh, Facebook, uh, on Instagram. Uh, my email is there, uh, Columbia University website. My Columbia email is there as well. Just any social media, Facebook, uh, just Google, and you can send me a message and I will certainly continue the conversation. She's everywhere. She's the da data woman, so you can find her everywhere. <laughs> what about you, Regina? <laughs> Yeah, so I'm also, am I muted? No, okay. So no, I'm also of course on LinkedIn as Regina Hubert, and I'm on, yeah, on, on Facebook with Transform Your Performance uh, and uh, my website, uh, transformyourperformance.com. I have a second uh, smaller website for the Powerful Leadership Transformation. If anybody wants to look into that certification program or just give me a call or send me an email to regina at transformyourperformance.com. So that's just my name with my website behind it. And uh, on Twitter, I'm Transform Dance because of my passion for dance. And then, of course, I'm always here to support, you know, individuals and teams as a coach to gain more visibility in their organization or any, any such topic or if they want to uh, get to a promotion faster. I also work with entrepreneurs. I work with women mostly, but not only. And... Um, yeah, and if you need a speaker for any of your events, whether it's a women's event, like Women's History Month is coming up soon in March again, uh, yeah. I'm here to invite your audience, in, in, uh, and it's a huge pleasure to do that. Uh, and yeah, whatever yeah. is possible to be powerfully in service as this is my <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Regina and thank Renee. You. It's been so inspiring and I really thank you for your insight and all the, all the knowledge that you've shared. And for the audience, I hope you liked it. It was really fantastic uh, for me. I learned so much. I was so inspired today. So I'm just asking you, I mean, like you heard, you know, get out of your comfort zone, take massive actions and really, you know, step into your greatness and become your best because you are limitless and please think beyond your self-limiting belief and remember that you are, you know, a multi-dimensional person and use all that, try to, you know, explore all that dimension to be the best and to better the world because that's the most important thing that we, we want to do, you know, here. So thank you very much for tuning in thank you. and uh, thank you. we'll see you for the next episode. And again, thanks to our wonderful Thank guests. you. And, uh, and, and then, uh, so have a good day because for you, you started the day. Have a tremendous day and, uh, and see you um, in another, you know, in another platform or uh, somewhere. Yes. Thank you very much. Take care.